Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Angelica Tom, and on behalf of Charles and the entire church, welcome everyone who is joining us in person and from cyberspace for tonight's event, Resisting the Throwaway Culture, How a Consistent Life Ethic Can Unite a Fractured People, featuring Charles Camosi, and I promise that's the only time I will say Charles tonight, okay? It's Charlie, everyone. Um, Charlie will be discussing his new book of the same name and will explore how an embrace of Pope Francis's challenge to resist the throwaway culture has the capacity to unite people who for the last several decades imagined themselves in polarized cultural wars. Charlie Camosi has a theme that runs throughout all his works and this theme revolves around the fostering of intellectual solidarity between political and ethical approaches which find conversation difficult. A Roman Catholic anthropology which refuses to choose between individually and communally constructed understandings of a person's dignity is particularly important in this regard. Charlie has put this intellectual solidarity into practice as the founding member of the organizing committee for an international conference designed to think and speak about abortion. The founder and he's the founder and co-director of the Catholic Conversation Project, an editor and contributor for CatholicMoralityTheology.com, and a board member of the Democrats for Life. Charlie is also on the board of the College, the I'm sorry, the College Theology Society and the Adversary Board of the New Evangelical Partnership for the Common Good. He is thrilled to be part of the international working group Contending Modern, Modern, Modernities, pardon me, which is spending four years exploring how Catholicism, Islam, and secular liberalism can productively interact in the public sphere with regard to difficult ethical issues related to science and bioethics. So this very long uh, biography and CV here is proof of an ever busy man, so therefore we are very delighted that he was able to make time to join us tonight. So please welcome Charlie Camosi. That bio needs to be updated, so um, I'll, uh, I'll ask. I, this is my. I'm so happy to be here for the third time speaking at the Catholic Information Center, and um, one of the main reasons I'm so delighted to do so is I always, 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 no pressure, get excellent questions in the question and answer session. So, especially critical questions. So please do. Um, ask your question, especially your critical questions, because selfishly I'm here as much to interact with you uh, as I am to deliver this lecture. Thanks to the CIC, especially Mitch, uh, who made this happen. Many of you know Mitch. I also want to thank New City Press for publishing my book. Uh, Claude, where's Claude? Claude's here, New City Press. Um, uh, the Focolare Apostolate runs New City Press, and my they're one of my favorite groups in the whole wide world, and I was so thrilled to be able to publish um, with the Focolare New City Press. They were very understanding also about my deadlines. I came to him kind of late in the game saying, I need this book by a certain time because I want to use it in an online course that Notre Dame wants me to do on throwaway culture. And so they were very, very generous with their resources to make sure we could do that. And I believe there are some books here that if, you, if you find yourself interested or um, uh, if you find yourself interested, or you think others might be interested, that um, the course is the main text for online, uh, of course, of the same title, uh, which Notre Dame will be um, having available to. I can talk uh, with you about that if you're interested, too. Okay, enough of the introductory remarks. I want to begin by offering you a phrase. I want to offer you a phrase and see if you've heard it before. Cardiac pole vibration. Anybody heard that phrase before? Nope. It comes from the debate over recent bills in several states banning abortion, referred uh, to by their opponents as so-called heartbeat bills. Alyssa Milano, who somehow has become a significant public voice on these and other matters, insisted that the media should not refer to heartbeat, but instead to use another similarly awkward phrase, quote, fetal pole cardiac activity, end quote. Now, you might just dismiss her as someone who doesn't know anything about prenatal biology. You might be right about that. But she got the phrase from an OBGYN named Jennifer Gutman, whose description was picked up by national media. The science correspondent for Slate, who interviewed Dr. Gutner, referred to it as, quote, a 
cluster of pulsating cells. Jennifer Kearns, an OBGYN at UC San Francisco and director of OBGYN at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, said that it is, quote, a group of cells with electrical activity, end quote. These and other authorities in medicine seem quite naturally to offer a definitive refutation of manipulative pro-life terms like heartbeat. But as a bioethicist, I know better than most just how deeply politics and especially abortion politics has infected even the most basic discussions of medicine and biology. In point of fact, the primordial heart is a, quote, group of cells in the same sense that you and I are groups of cells. Open any embryology textbook and they will tell you that at six weeks gestation, the human heart has four chambers and is pumping blood unidirectionally. These very same people, apart from the debate, importantly, apart from the debate over heartbeat bills, will tell pregnant patients at six or seven weeks that their baby's heartbeat is so many beats per minute, and make sure that parents can listen to that heartbeat. Indeed, as many of you know who have been close to a pregnancy at this stage, the heartbeat is an incredibly important marker for the health of the prenatal child at this stage of life. The kinds of rhetorical moves used by pro-choice physicians and the debate over heartbeat bills is a classic example of what Pope Francis calls our throwaway culture, where even human beings are reduced to mere things, which can then be discarded as so much trash. Part of dehumanization, I think an essential part in most cases, which takes place is the use of specific words and phrases for unwanted, inconvenient human beings, which makes them easier to discard. As the website Secular Pro-Life said around the time of this debate, the embryonic heart is a bunch of pulsating cells in exactly the same way that the embryo herself is often described as a clump of cells. Use of the phrase in both contexts serves as a rhetorical move made to downplay the fact that abortion kills unwanted prenatal humans. Even using the term fetus rather than baby is a classic dehumanization tactic of the early culture. When the child is wanted, we talk about baby bumps and baby showers. And an OBGYN tells you that your baby is doing great. But when the topic is abortion, when the prenatal child is unwanted, suddenly the language shifts and doctors and others talk about a fetus or products of conception or even a parasite. This despite the fact that as Dr. Christian Collier of the University of Mich Michigan Medical School has demonstrated quite powerfully, Mother and prenatal child cooperate with each other in pregnancy, during pregnancy, in deeply profound and moving ways, astonishing ways. And I thought I knew a lot about that, but she educated me on just some astonishing things. The same group that is um, incidentally putting on um, my online course at Notre Dame is, is going to um, use her, uh, they're going to put her uh, presentation on this in a YouTube video. And I can't wait to share that because it's just so astonishing. It just blows up the very idea of, of parasitical relationship at all. It's mutually relational. NPR's official guidance, however, says to avoid language suggesting that, quote, there is a baby inside a pregnant woman, not a fetus. Babies are not babies until they are born. They're fetuses. Incorrectly calling a fetus a baby or the unborn is part of a strategy used by anti-abortion. No. Correctly calling the prenatal child a baby is resisting the throwaway culture's tendency to inconsistently shift our language to make human beings easier to throw away. I suppose one could try to be consistent in the other direction, but somehow I think phrases like fetus bump and fetus shower are going to have a hard time catching. The developed West slouch towards assisted suicide is also an example, a classic example of throwaway culture. In Oregon, for instance, physical pain doesn't make the top five reasons people request PAS. The number one is fear of loss of autonomy, number one reason, fear of loss of autonomy. Also high on the list is fear of being a burden on others. Perhaps my favorite article by a bioethicist um, was by Gilbert Mylander, um, which he titled, I want to be a burden on my family. Social justice activists already know in other areas about how disabled, non-autonomous, quote, burdensome human beings are unfairly treated and marginalized by enablist culture. But on the issue of PAS, we are content to use language and logic the throwaway culture in spades. Rather than work to create a culture in which autonomy, 
and independence are not prerequisites for mattering, where burdens are shared and even celebrated. We diabolically work to make it easier for these marginalized populations to kill themselves. One only needs to read Pope St. John Paul II's Evangelium Vitae, his great encyclical on the Gospel of Life, to see that Catholic teaching applies um, with regard to this issue of protection and support of life well beyond abortion and physician-assisted suicide. Historically, many injustices have taken place precisely because we are beholden to a particular ideology which makes human beings invisible, especially when their dignity is most inconvenient. But following one's principles consistently across a range of issues will mitigate against this tendency. In resisting throwaway culture, I am at pains to dismantle throwaway culture wherever we can find it, regardless of our secular political ideology. Think about the Me Too movement, for instance. People with a kind of politics which leads them to miss throwaway culture in abortion and euthanasia can see quite clearly how our sexual, our sexual culture turns people into things to be used and discarded, often with explicit violence, even more often with implicit or structural violence. How about homelessness and mental health more generally? We can see the result of our throwaway culture even in the streets of our cities. But there's also a hidden homelessness in rural areas as well. I had to stick up for my rural Wisconsin problems in these areas. Many of these homeless are veterans, as you well know. People we sent to war to experience and perpetuate all kinds of violence. But their dignity is now quite inconvenient for us, especially if they are mentally ill, and they are discarded like a kind of trash onto our streets. Happily, both right and left are beginning to see how throwaway culture functions when it comes to mass incar in incarceration in the US, a country which bears the humiliating record for the highest such rate in the world. Instead of trying to focus on the root causes of crime, especially drug addiction, we are simply happy to throw human beings away into our jails and prisons at ridiculously high rates and even make a profit in certain cases off their slave wages. We are also happy to discard migrants claiming asylum protection, protection often from deadly violence, especially in the Northern Triangle, dehumanizing them by naming them as merely illegals or some such phrase produced by throwaway culture to hide their inherent dignity equal with ours. We have even been willing to separate children from their families, explicitly using their anguish as a kind of strategic deterrence. Another classic example of throwaway culture, using a vulnerable population as a mere means to an end rather than an end in herself. We need to examine how throwaway culture functions also when it comes to the world of the non-human. Throwaway culture is very important as we think about the root causes of climate change, especially as we discard our trash and carbon emissions, often without a second thought what this means for our current generation, but especially for future generations. I argue we also ought to think about how we treat non-human animals as part of the throwaway culture. We use one set of words and phrases for them when they're wanted as pets, right? But a very different set when we want to use them as food. And boy, is it difficult to imagine a more terrible example of throwing away than what we do to animals in factory farms. But it becomes either we do this uh, for them or we think of them, as the factory farms say, as, quote, protein units per square foot. At least in my circles, my sense of the pro-life movement, especially among young pro-lifers, is that something like resisting throwaway culture could be, or in some cases already is, the growing edge, or a growing edge, of the pro-life movements. Archbishop, uh, Archbishop Gomez of Los Angeles recently noted that, quote, there are no single issue saints, end quote. Frankly, I don't know any single issue pro-lifers, but that's often a criticism that's thrown around a lot. Even those who might be tempted to be put into, even those that might be tempted to be put in this camp beyond abortion to euthanasia, embryonic stem cell research, IVF, human trafficking, and more. This kind of approach also conserves the origins of the pro-life movement before Roe versus Wade, which, as the historian Daniel K. Williams demonstrated in his absolutely remarkable book, Defenders of the Unborn, was made up of a very ideologically diverse group of people. Again, this is the pro-life movement before Roe versus Wade, and, and after, especially before. 
As hard as it is for us to imagine today, large percentages of those who attended pro-life rallies were also anti-war activists. They even, and this is an amazing vignette uh, that he, he offered in the book, they even burned their birth certificates as tools of government oppression at pro-life rallies in much the same way they burned their draft cards at anti-war rallies. Because they uh, uh, thought of the birth certificate as an arbitrary place to assign human and legal dignity. Rejecting a single issue approach is not only faithful to the gospel, it not only better conserves the history of the pro-life movement, but I argue that it's an absolutely essential tool if we want to be evangelical in our approaches to pro-life history. So many of our fellow U.S. Americans agree with much of what the pro-life movement proposes. You have to look at uh, opinion polls about that. So much of what the pro-life movement is um, after is very popular. <clears throat> Uh, yet, these very same people often cannot see themselves as part of the pro-life movement, especially insofar as they see it as uniquely about abortion. I want to argue quite strongly that consistently resisting throwaway culture across a range of issues is key to winning converts for the pro-life movement. Now, there are some important um, members and in the pro-life movement who hear the word consistent uh, ethic of life and raise their eyebrows a bit. There is some out there. And it may seem that what I'm proposing is an attempt to reduce abortion to one issue among many, or to marginalize abortion as not as important as other issues. But this is not the case, nor for me, and nor is it the case uh, for the church leaders on which I rely in making my argument. This was not a fair criticism even of Cardinal Ernadine, who takes a lot of flack for it, for he was explicit about the fact that not all issues in the consistent life ethic are equal in gravity, and the right to life is the most important value. Pope St. John Paul II had Bernadine's back on the CLE, especially in his pivotal 1990 encyclical Evangelium Vitae, which I mentioned earlier. It surprised no one, of course, that a pope writing on the gospel had a focus on abortion and euthanasia, and he did have a central focus on that. But it may be surprising to some that his pro-life ethic went beyond classic issues and consistently calling out a number of different but interrelated issues which transcend the liberal and conservative binary, including poverty and the death penalty. Pope Benedict XVI's work in this area um, reflected the views of his predecessors, unsurprisingly. In his encyclical Caritas and Veritate, for instance, Benedict explicitly says the distinction between pro-life issues and social justice issues is false. Uh, and euthanasia and embryo-destructive research are to be understood as social justice issues, just as global consumerism, ecological concern, care for the poor are to be understood as issues. If one simply looks then at what the Catholic Church teaches, it becomes clear that some version of the CLE is authoritative for faithful Catholics. September 23rd is the first day of fall, as you may know, my favorite part of time of year. Uh, it's fall, though, the year before a presidential election, so you know better than I do what this means. We're about to kick off in earnest our nation's long, secular, liturgical season of, of anticipation, a kind of bizarro world advent, especially given uh, this coming, this particular coming national liturgical season. I'm sure a question like the back or maybe even the front of your minds. How does anything like what I lay out here work in our current political environment. Indeed, the debate over abortion seems on the verge of tearing our country apart. The wild divergence of state laws is bad enough, with cities like Long Beach, California, as you may remember, restricting travel to states where abortion was recently limited. Some people, including me, worry that the 2020 general election and a likely SCOTUS decision, a Supreme Court decision on abortion next term, might lead to even worse things. Immigration is the classic wedge issue used to drive people apart at a fundamental level. Either you are an inveterate racist or you want the United States to cease to have borders. There doesn't seem to be anything in between. And as you may know, overall, Congress is more polarized than at any time since Civil War Reconstruction. Even rats have a higher um, approval rating than Congress does. I'm not joking about that. I get these concerns. Boy, do I get them. But let me say a few things in response that are more hopeful. 
First, Catholics, it should be clear, owe our ultimate loyalty to Christ and his church, and not a secular political party. To the extent that Catholics fit easily within our secular politics, I would humbly suggest that the danger of idolatry looms very large. We should expect not to fit into right or left categories. We, of course, are a pilgrim people who I think should therefore expect to um, taste political homelessness very, very often. Second, though we can go on and on about political polarization, and it is a major problem to be sure, U.S. Americans are increasingly refusing to accept our lazy and incoherent liberal conservative binary. Just 10 years ago, 34% of U.S. Americans identified as independents, but today that number is 44%, the highest percentage in 75 years of, of Pew tracking this number. By contrast, the poll found only 27% identify as Democrats and 26% as Republicans. A major 2008 study of political affiliation in the U.S. titled Hidden Tribes found something similar. As the New York Times put it in their coverage of the study, quote, most people do not see their lives through a political lens, and when they have political views, the views are far less rigid than those of the highly politically engaged, ideologically orthodox tribes, end quote. Indeed, two-thirds of U.S. Americans, according to this study, belong to what they describe as a, quote, exhausted majority. In some ways, I wrote the book um, for the exhausted majority. These members, quote, share a sense of fatigue with our polarized national conversation, a willingness to be flexible in their political viewpoints, and a lack of voice in the national conversation, end quote. These data points indicate that we may be able to do away with the hopelessly simplistic assum assumptions present in the two-dimensional right-left liberal conservative thinking about politics. Indeed, post-Trump, forces may have well been set in motion which lead to the whole model to finally come crashing down. The fact that we are in the midst of a major political realignment in the United States has now been highlighted by everyone, from Chuck Todd to Michael Barone, Eugene Robinson, Carl Rowe to Roka, Peggy Noonan, and many more. Robinson put the matter bluntly, quote, my view is that the traditional left to right, progressive to conservative, Democrat to Republican, political axis we're all so familiar with is no longer a valid schematic of American political opinion. And I believe neither party has the foggiest idea of what the new, uh, the new diagram looks like, end quote. The old coalitions do seem to be falling apart. Donald Trump, of course, won without being either clearly a liberal or conservative candidate and has remade the Republican Party into a very different kind of thing. At the same time, many evangelical Christians responsible for the last iteration of the Republican Party with their formation of the moral majority in the late 70s are increasingly uncomfortable with today's GOP. Southern Baptists, for instance, have begun to distance themselves from the Republican Party as evidenced by protests surrounding Mike Pence's speech at Southern Baptist Convention in 2018. Working class Democrats, wor working class Catholics, once a democratic base, have now been pushed out by a hyper-secular party intent on driving their agenda through identity politics. Large numbers of Latinos and Latinas, despite the Democratic Party's all-in stance on, uh, and purity tests, frankly, for abortion rights, strongly identify with the goals of anti-abortion pro-lifers. Once belonging to a party deeply skeptical of free trade, 72% of Democrats now believe U.S. tariffs will harm the economy in the long run. This while 80% of Republicans, once belonging to the party of free trade, believe either these tariffs will have no effect or will actually be helpful. Two years after Trump's election, many pundits see the trends reflected in the 2018 midterm elections, claiming that um, changes in voting reflected less of what we think what some have called a blue wave, and the kind of uncertainty and turbulence of a country in the midst of profound political realignment. The ranks formed for the left-right culture wars in the 70s and 80s, put simply, are not this world. And it may be young people, millennials, and Gen Z who push them to their final collapse. Consider these four facts about those two generations. One and two refuse to identify as Democrats or Republicans. They are fiercely committed to service and social change. They don't see politics or government as a primary way of positively affecting social change. And 71% see a need for a major new third party. The rise of this new generation or set of generations coincides with the broader disintegration of our political culture. And this creates a gift-wrapped opportunity for pro-lifers, in my opinion. 
a gift wrapped opportunity for pro-lifers to help US culture rethink our politics. As Michael Steele, former head of the RNC put it, young people are going to destroy the old silos, scatter their elements to the wind, and reassemble them in ways that make sense for them and this new era. The script for creating the replacement political culture, though, of course, has yet to be written. Some worry that our radical moral diversity will leave us so hopelessly fragmented that such common script writing is impossible. And indeed, if we plow ahead at this moment of realignment too quickly, if we skip ahead to 10-point plans or contracts with America, I believe we will miss a very rare and important opportunity to do something far more lasting and significant. Here at this moment of political and social uncertainty, lies a golden opportunity to slow down and catch up, to resist our political anxieties and tend to our deep spiritual wounds. What ails us as a culture at bottom has very little to do with politics or policy. As important as those concerns are, the root of the problem goes much deeper to our foundational understandings of the good. Jonah Goldberg recently said, politics cannot fill the holes in our souls. Indeed, a hyper-focus on politics and policy keeps us frothy and anxious at a surface level in ways that distract and even prohibit us from the kinds of foundational introspection that will shower. Scrub the dirt and grime that has built up over the years and even decades. Put salve on our neglected wounds and burns. Step away from the anxieties of the news and election cycles, and instead focus on more fundamental questions. What is it that we value most in life? What grounds these values? What do these values mean for how we ought to live together with our neighbors? This engagement with our neighbors, in fact, is at the heart of what Pope, is, Pope Francis calls a culture of encounter. And it is the antidote to throwaway culture. The culture of encounter is the antidote to throwaway culture. But this is very, very difficult when so many powerful forces, including social media, and maybe especially social media, are pushing us to disconnect from genuine encounters with others, thus leading to what some are calling a public health crisis of loneliness and deaths of despair, which have led, um, which have led to US life expectancy going down for three straight years, the worst drop since World War I. We are disconnected, lonely, anxious, stressed, despairing, a people which is literally killing ourselves. Many have tried to distract themselves from these issues by focusing on national politics. As one Atlantic headline put it, national politics has taken over America. But engaging politics from a place of loneliness and despair often leads to the kind of angry, polarized, hate-driven politics that I described earlier in the talk. Indeed, especially after the 2018 midterm elections, political commentators suggested that the U.S. might be in the midst of a cold civil war. One West Virginia voter quoted on election day uh, morning 2018 put it this way, quote, I am so upset, I just feel physically ill. Just It is so heartbreaking that all we can do is bring each other down and cut into each other. I feel like I'm going to cry, end quote. Politics not only cannot uh, fill the hole in our souls, it is currently making that hole much, much bigger. And as the head of the Communion and Liberation Movement likes to say, quote, if you don't think Pope Francis is the cure, you don't grasp the disease, end quote. In Laudato Si number 128, Francis decries the idea that, quote, polit political efforts or the force of law will be sufficient for creating authentic, robust, life-giving change, end quote. On the contrary, the Holy Father is primarily concerned about the need to create a culture of encounter and hospitality precisely the kind of counterculture needed to address what is killing us. Francis calls us to, quote, face-to-face -face encounters with others, with their physical presences which challenge us, with their pain and their pleas, with their joys which infect us in our close and continuous interaction, end quote. Further discussion of this point is, like where, I'd, is where I'd like to end my remarks today. I respect Catholics and other Christians um, who look around at our individualism consumerist culture and believe that we need a deep alternative. To be clear, I'm not a Benedict Option guy who believes we ought to form communities explicitly disconnected from national political structures and concerns. But I do respect those who are drawn to the Benedict Option, because I think they do have a very important insight. A very important insight. 
I think many pro-lifers could benefit from a, what I might call a strategic retreat from national politics and focus on living out and strengthening a culture of encounter in our own lives and in our local communities. Such encounters, especially with people who don't think like you, can force us to take a harder look at ourselves and how our views and actions might be counterintuitively contributing to the intersecting forces which create and sustain throwaway culture. If we could live in this space where we can be transformed by such encounters, maybe for several months or perhaps even a year or two, we could return to a focus in U.S. national politics. We could use the time not only to for the, allow the change to take place, but reflect on the new person we are becoming and daydream. Yes, daydream, a practice very rare in the age of smartphones, am I right? About the new ways you might approach the public thing. Take, take walks, subway and train rides without earbuds, or car rides without radio or Bluetooth in the background. Volunteer in prisons, nursing homes, detention centers, and other places where we house those who are thrown away. Meditate, pray, go to confession, adore the Blessed Sacrament. Be still in the certainty that God is doing something new to us. Maybe then we'd be ready for the next election cycle or two in a different way. But maybe not. No way we should than that. Yes, many will implore us not to sit out the most important of our lifetime. Right? Trademark. But that will be okay. Given the amount of power we've invested in the presidency and the Supreme Court, will be the most important election for our lifetime for the foreseeable future. And I really hope um, you offer your honest feedback and questions here to have a robust discussion. I ask you to pay attention to how God is working in your life. And for what it's worth, here's what I intend to do after doing this myself for the last few years, or for the last several months. I, I mean, it's probably come through in my talk, I don't have much hope for either party. After a period of deep reflection, I resigned from the Board of Democrats for Life and registered as a member of the American Solidarity Party. They're a small but growing party, and if you don't know much about them, I encourage you to look them up. They're a very interesting alternative, in my opinion. Um, they're trying to serve what I call the ulks, <laughs> Those who inhabit the upper left quadrant of a graph, if you think of the x-axis being the left right for, um, for uh, say, uh, social issues and uh, the y-axis being economic issues, uh, you think left right there, there's this upper left quadrant which is um, conservative on social issues and progressive or liberal on economic issues, which has tens of millions of people in it and totally unserved by the uh, American Solidarity Party is one of those two parties which is trying to serve the all. Uh, so I've decided, at least in my own reflections on this, to kind of play the long game and um, work towards a party which uh, can more authentically serve uh, people for life. And I, I think the liberal conservative binary is bad even when there's X and Y um, axes, but at least it's a, more, a slightly more complicated way of how we normally think about it. You may come to a different conclusion. Uh, but at least if you're like me, you'll come to an authentic conclusion after a significant period of retreat from an idolatrous uh, life amidst the froth and angst of national secular politics. I'm not, not guilty in all of this. I, I've been obsessed with national politics for far too long. If you're like me, um, you'll need to be personally transformed by provocative, profound encounters with God and neighbor. And if you're like me, uh, only then will you be fortified to resist our powerful throwaway culture the politics grounded in a culture of encounter and hospitality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie Camosi. And now we can begin the robust discussion that he's looking forward to. So I have the mic here and just raise your hand. I will walk to you and then you can ask your question. So those who are viewing at home can hear you. I founded a chapter there a few years ago, and over the past few years, I've held events in honor of Dorothy Day. And so I think she is a figure, one of many, who, in whom we can find some inspiration or guidance to overcome these. Um, and she was first and foremost called from the uh, encounter with hospitality. Yeah. Could you offer any reflections on that? Yeah, I first um, 
got to know Dorothy Day and uh, the Houses of Hospitality that she inspired uh, as a graduate student at Notre Dame. Father Michael Baxter was, he was Father Michael Baxter at that point uh, at Notre Dame, and he was one of my professors. And uh, we learned a lot about um, uh, Dorothy Day and her movement and um, the Kelly Work movement today. Uh, what I think is particularly interesting is she combined um, not only actually physically living with um, and the drug addicted and the uh, work thrown away in the culture. Her activism was very similar to the kind of activism that I have in the lecture tonight. So she was unapologetic, un unapologetically killing and abortion youth in Asia. But as you may know, she kind of made her name as. Um, Deep and profound. In my home institution in 1981, he was also profoundly motivated by Roe in the middle of the Cold War. Line in the New York Times. That day there was, and the line was. Uh, Cardinal comes out against abortion and nuclear weapons, and this kind of blew up into what eventually become a consistent line. He was clearly right in the midst of that tradition, not only in theology, but in her practice of physically opening her home, creating a movement of physically opening homes to those who are thrown away. Okay. Thank you very much for your, your very good uh, talk. Um, so I understand you're friends with Peter Singer. Yeah. Is that, so it seems like you're trying to, even though you have such different positions, in a sense you're trying to evangelize through a, a, an approach of encounter with him. I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit about your relationship with him and what kind of, if you have been able to sway him at all or, uh, anyways. Uh, there's lots I could say about that. I could say just read my book, Peter Singer and Christian Ethics, but I'm not going to. Um, I'll say two quick things. It's one need to be pushed on power. Help me really dive into the tradition in ways that you and I have talked about in the past. But he's also our um, really important ways and euthanasia in really important ways because he's one of the few people. Who follow his positions consistently. Just the fact that if you think uh, uh, a late term fetus is not a fetus, there's absolutely no reason to grant personhood to the newborn infant. In cases where the newborn infant is born prematurely, there are plenty of prenatal children who are far more advanced than um, the, the, NIC, the NICU baby. And he's also got a point when it comes to the end of life. So if we're, if it's being rational and self aware that matters, then what about people at the end of life who aren't important? To highlight them, even if for no other reason, rhetorically, it shows our opponents. I often just say to an interlocutor of mine, like, "Tell me why Peter Singer's wrong," and it's uh, it's a it's a, I found it an effective way to engage uh, the abortion debate. But I I have not I I think I've convinced him that if we're going to start treating animals uh, as God ordered us to and as the church teaches with kindness, um, he be on board with this. I convinced he used to think that Christianity was the bad guy and Judeo Christian tradition was the bad guy. He no longer thinks that. He thinks we can be allies. I've also come to the conclusion, though he hasn't really articulated this, that his entree into bioethics and to these discussions was really about defending animals. He published, you may know, Animal Liberation, that was his first major book. And he, he, he kind of reasoned backwards okay, so. So it follows from that that this other thing about abortion and euthanasia and disabled people. But his he was motivated at first by animals where his book. Because when I the fetus and we always go on our debates. I really uh, over the years I've come to think of him as his his path would have been a different one. But that's just my speculation after a decade or so of interactions. Next question. Thank you for the talk. Is there 
I'm still a little bit confused as to what exactly throwaway culture is. Like you gave us the list of, of policy things that you think are sort of correlated. But so for homelessness, right, like a lot of re the reason that a lot of these homeless people are on the streets is that 50 years ago they would have been involuntarily committed to a state hospital. And it's like those reforms are a bad system, I think, from and caring for our you know brothers and sisters but have had this effect. And I think you can make sort of similar cases for a lot of the other policy areas that, you know, there's arguments on both sides that are promoting, you know, the dignity of people. And I'm sort of curious about what your first principles are that say, okay, all of these things are lumped together, things are on the other side. Well, there's, you, you mentioned a number of things. Is, um, do you want me to just give a more precise way culture or, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, it would be a, a culture that is consumerist, especially, uh, but not only, which um, turns uh, many entities, but as uh, Pope Francis considered it, turns people who are properly ends in themselves into mere things to be used as a mere means to and often discarded. And often changing our language, changing our um, behaviors, inconsistently applying our principles, precisely because identity is so inconvenient for us. And I've heard that argument about uh, homeless, uh, homeless uh, people, and um, I don't know. I, I, they're very much in my in my uh, in my world in New York, and I know they're very much in most people's worlds here, probably. And my conversations with them don't lead me to think that they belong in an institution. Um, that's just my own sort of experience. Maybe others have different experiences. Um, some do, probably. But I don't think it's fair to say um, it's not at least not as, it's not my experience that um, most of those people need to be in institutions or something. And even going back to the houses of Baxter ran in South Bend, uh, the people there uh, often just needed a place to take a shower and clothes and opportunity to go on a job interview. You know, um, the um, uh, let's see if I can remember the statistic. Oh yeah, the um, the most common age to be homeless is one year old. Uh, the because so many uh, pregnant women uh, end up in situations where they lose access to uh, their house and shelter, and then they give birth as a homeless person. So the the most common age to be, and that's a very important part of uh, of this debate. It seems to me. As, as someone from, I guess, the aforementioned city of South Bend itself, and I guess just more in general, I'm not originally coming from one of these huge East Coast cities. I guess I feel, but that's just, just a continuous discussion on homelessness. It's a very different sort of poverty, in having lived in both now. So. You mentioned audio about wool, and I guess, I'm not sure you call it, but wool. Not urban poverty. Like, for example, in South Bend, in South Bend, there were three or four people who, or who ever are genuine, or like homeless. Like, there's always the same people at the same places. But having moved here, someone like Washington, you can walk down a block and see three or four or five homeless people, maybe even with the beds and stuff out on the street. How do you approach those two different, very different settings of poverty? Uh, well, I'm not an expert. That's, as Obama might say, above my pay grade. Um, I, I'm not here to even say whether with your character, characterization of that. Um, I don't know whether that's actually true as somebody who's lived in New York and South Bend and experienced the homeless in New York and South Bend myself. Um, if it is true, uh, then I'd want people who have um, context and then have the best kind of response which resists the way culture's tendency to simply discard such people on the street and to think about ways in which we can orient our lives to genuinely encounter um, 
someone and someone's whose dignity is quite inconvenient for us. Um, so, so how do you address issues when the pro-life position isn't always clear? Like, uh, for example, if an environmental regulation uh, might push back the effects of global warming, but could also put somebody out of work or you know force poor people to pay more on their energy bills, what do you do in a situation like that? Yeah, I, I don't. Th one of the things I do in the book is prescind from any kind of discussion about public policy at all. Um, I was very, I had to be very disciplined because I wanted to speak about public policy. But I think those debates are super complicated, ridiculously complicated sometimes. And um, even on abortion, not just uh, you know migrant, uh, you know border policies or or, uh, or, or policies about ecological protection, you know, we have a big debate within even the pro-life movement about um, what health means and, the, you know, the, the debate over the mother exception and things like that. So the thing I was really trying to do in the book is saying we get so anxious and worked up about those policy debates, and we make an idol, I would argue, out of those policy debates, that we often lose, in an attempt to be effective in those debates, we often lose track of the animating values and first principles which should be guiding us followers of Christ and, and, and uh, proclaimers of the gospel. So, um, you know, I, I don't have what the, what, the, what the policy should be about that complicated, those complicated issues you mentioned. I do want us to kind of reorient our, our moral lives and future um, generations, especially. global climate change for reasons you might imagine. Think about future Filipinos uh, when we decide about what we're going to do in terms of future energy sources. I also want to think about people who struggle to keep the lights on and the heat on in the winter because they can't afford to pay their heating bill, as you mentioned. So one reason I wanted to rescind from those debates about policy was we can get become so obsessed with them, and I include myself in this, that I think we can often lose what needs to happen at this particular moment Charlie, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, who introduced you earlier said that you were, I guess, didn't know that you were no longer chairman or whatever for Democrats for life. Not on the board. Yeah. My first question was going to be, where are the other four members tonight? What are they doing? But on a more serious note, I'd like to think that one could not consider oneself part the throwaway culture that one has to embrace a bunch of policy positions that you, you know, climate change. I mean, there are great opinions on both, scientific opinions on all sides of that. And in fact, you know, barring major, major, I don't work for an oil company, but bar, barring major, major rapid changes in technology, we're going to be fossil fuel for a long time. Agriculture is very energy intensive, very fossil fuel intensive. And, to, you know, to be zero carbon by whatever date Democrats talk about all the time would kill millions of people because they, we'd starve. Whether you couldn't make the fertilizer at a decent price anymore or get the stuff to market. And I also hope not being part of the throwaway culture means you have to be a vegan or a vegetarian. I really couldn't tell, tell where you were going with animals. And the last oh. point, and the, just the last one, open borders. It's very heartbreaking. You have to have a heart of stone and not have a broken, you know, to not have your heart break when a, a child is separated from a parent who's put into a detention center. But you know, in this country, every day, it's heartbreaking that when parents commit crimes like robbery or car theft or drugs, there are, there are parent-child separations when parents go to, to jail breaking the law. And I just hope that when we talk about avoiding the throwaway culture, that that does not become a euphemism for the whole social justice agenda, because I don't know what the phrase means. Matter of fact, I stopped going to mass that led by Jesuits because I got sick of hearing about justice when I don't really know it. When it's so, such an adjustable phrase, anything to anybody. And thank you for your time. So uh, that's a lot, um, but I, I'll do, I will say this. I, 
I'll try to remember what I wanted to say, but I wasn't I've been trying to do different things. The first thing is that again the book really presents from those debates about politics and policy. Because I really think it's a more fundamental change that we need to undergo as a culture before we can really engage those questions authentically in good faith, being confident that God has done something new in us and reoriented our lives in in conjunction with a, a culture of encounter and hospitality. Uh, and so I focus a lot in the book on things we can do in our own lives apart from those policy questions. And I'm afraid to say, <laughs> this is actually one of my criticisms of the so-called left on um, uh, on climate change. If I see one more person um, you know, going, uh, going green and then as they eat their cheeseburger or steak, I'm gonna lose it because the most important contributor to global climate change are factory farms. And so, because the methane is just the worst for the environment, not by, not by total carbon emission, but by the, the, the terribleness of, the, um, of, the, of methane, which comes literally from piles of crap, uh, huge monstrous piles of feces that come from uh, the factory farms. And so one of the most important things to do on one's own, in one's own life, I think, is to not uh, uh, frequent, uh, not support factory farms. Which, which not only throw away God's creation by reducing it to protein units per square foot, but is like one of the most important contributors to global climate change. So I, I, I think there's a lot we can do personally on our own, and especially our resisting consumer culture, which is, you know, constantly we hear about so-called overpopulation and people wanting uh, people of color overseas to have fewer babies, when it's our consumerist culture that is, and, and other consumerist cultures around the world who are the most... Uh, important contributors to global climate change. So here are here are ways that we can resist uh, on our own without getting into those. I think those debates are important to have. I don't think they're I, I because they're so complicated. I, I I think of the easy answers that are offered and the and the two options almost always two options that are offered are are not really serious and are basically political, not attempts to actually solve the problem. Um, I hope I think that's what I wanted to say in response to that. And I would say that not just about. Uh, uh, climate change issues, but some of the other issues you raised as well. We have time for one more question. Uh, thank you for your talk tonight. So, but two full, I guess, questions, so to speak. So the first part is, uh, it seems to me that from what you've been speaking about is that the problem kind of evolves when we um, focus too much on policy, when policy becomes the answer to this or that. Um, and instead, I'm reminded of de Tocqueville, who talks about our institutions. Um, and perhaps that, in some cases, we've lost that, um, or there's been an erosion of our institutions um, within kind of the American experiment, so to speak. Um, and so perhaps it might be better to refocus on a rebuilding of those institutions, um, insofar as they create um, uh, there's a French philosopher, Remy Bra, I probably mispronounced his last name, um, but he has a book called Moderately Modern, and in it he talks about the idea is culture um, tells us what we ought to do. Um, that can be for good or for bad. Um, and so along those lines, if you think of these institutions are really what should create our culture, not our politics, our politics perhaps um, are how we orient the city or the polis together, um, but perhaps the institutions themselves, um, whether that is the church, local associations, um, and they help guide us towards how we ought to act as human beings. Um, perhaps that needs to be our focus because then policies kind of come from that because then it's all about how do we act and how do we orient ourselves. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, that's very well said. Um, uh, uh, an attempt to kind of quiet and take a strategic retreat from the froth and angst of, of national politics, I think, could be on two different levels we talked about on an individual level where one takes the earbuds out gets oneself in front of the blessed sacrament uh, stops uh, constantly um, using the smartphone as a distraction from hearing God's voice in, in your heart and in your mind um, but then you know listening to that voice and then acting in such a way that does choose to engage and rebuild and really pointing to so we really need people who are going to put their focus into Catholic to volunteer a place of encounter for people instead of a place that just dispenses the sacraments three times in life. We need people who are going to uh, 
uh, coach little league baseball and and um, volunteer at the local soup, local soup kitchen and do these things. But our institutions, as you rightly point out, are either really struggling in these areas, except in some areas. But in most places, they're struggling. Many places, they're struggling. Um, uh, and and people don't know necessarily where they can find the genuine encounter. Even if people by what is genuine encounter again? I don't find it at church. I don't find it at my school. I don't find it at work. Everything is uh, attempted. In some ways, our culture is designing us for the lack of those kinds of encounters. And so it, I think the first part maybe is the um, individuals a sense of strategic retreat and prayer and reflection. Think differently, and then a sense of you know, listening and, and, and then acting in a way that revivifies the, those kinds of Well, thank you everyone for being here, and thank you, Kamosi, for your insights and your commentary on that uh, front. Yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we could have thought of it. No cheeseburger. I'm sorry. Uh, Try an impossible burger. It's amazing. Yeah, they, they have cheeseburgers now. <laughs> they look realistic. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that's my commentary at Meat Eater. Um, Yes, he will be outside uh, signing books as well as answering more of your questions. Continue the discussion until 8 p.m. Uh, one of my favorite things of solutions is to get before the Blessed Sacrament. Behind Charles is uh, Charlie uh, Tabernacle. So feel free to join us here for adoration every day from 1 to 4, as well as daily mass at 12.05. And you can check out our next events at CICDC.org. But thank you, everyone, for joining us, and uh, please uh, come out for a, a little wine and cheese. Thank you.